Chris Hensley is a registered representative of Cambridge Investment Research, Inc., a broker-dealer member of FINRA, SIPC, investment advisor representative of Cambridge Investment Research Advisors, Inc., a registered investment advisor. Cambridge and Houston First Financial Group are not affiliated. Good morning. You're listening to KPFT Houston. I'm Chris Hensley. The time is now 11 a.m., Got a great show lined up for you today. Relevant to all ages, this authentic volume is an antithesis to the traditional self-help book, particularly relevant to self-help Alex, uh, which I am a self-professed um, self-development self-help Alex. I like that. Who may have sought answers for a myriad of authors. Potentially human introduces something innovative and different. Dee's unique approach to the fusion of science and spirituality offers a new insight into human development, encouraging readers to discover our own inner and outer worlds. Our guest today is Jessica J.D., and we will do a deep dive into her new book, Potentially Human. So please stay tuned. Keep listening. If you are a longtime listener, you know that we always reserve just the first few moments of the show to tell you a little bit about what's going on in the Houston and the Gulf Coast region when it comes to financial literacy. So we did make it through Financial Literacy Month. That was April of uh, last uh, last month, but what we call Financial Literacy Week or Houston Money Week is actually a month-long celebration of financial literacy for us here. And so we got through all of, of the month of April. We actually have closed it out for the year. But I still want to encourage people who are looking for financial literacy workshops uh, to visit the HoustonMoneyWeek.org website. The reason for that is that it is not a uh, static website. It is dynamic. It is updated. And many of the for-profit, non-profit uh, community partners that we have do offer financial literacy classes and workshops and seminars free to the public throughout the year. So even though we had that focus in April, uh, hundreds, uh, well over 200 different free financial seminars and workshops for Houstonians, um, Gulf Coast area, Used to be just Houstonians, but it has grown so much in the past 11 years uh, that it is all over the outskirts of Houston's as well. So it's easier just to say Gulf Coast region. Uh, but I encourage you, if you are looking for workshops, help, and assistance in that area, HoustonMoneyWeek.org has that dynamic website. So it will include all of our nonprofit partners as well, um, the uh, VITA program, which is tax preparation. I know we're past taxes now, but... Uh, this will kind of tune you into the the uh, nonprofit organizations that can help with tax preparation for low to moderate income. Lots of different workshops still going on throughout the year. So with that, I do want to maximize the amount of time that we have with Jessica. So let's go ahead and get Jessica on the line here. Jessica, are you there? I am. Good morning, Christopher. Thank you and KPFT Houston for having me. Absolutely. Thank you for joining us. So I, I no, I'm excited to be here this morning. Thanks so much. I'd like to share your, your bio with listeners just a little bit so that they can get to know you a little bit better here. Now, you are a renowned uh, entrepreneur, speaker, and coach. Uh, Jessica J.D. launches revolutionary nonfiction manuscript encompassing metaphysics, genealogy, and spirituality. D's Dee's debut release is part autobiographical and wholly inspirational. Now, uniquely, you've served in the Marine Corps for 12 years, uh, and you use your personal and professional experience to delve into what it means to be human. Uh, bringing your own spiritual and metaphysical experiences to the fore, D offers a brave yet vulnerable analysis of how and why we make the decisions that we do, providing a unique and thought-provoking book in the process. So, welcome once again. Thank you so much for sharing that. You know, and um, Christopher, this this book has been about three years in the making. And I, um, you mentioned at the introduction at the first part of the show, um, self developmentaholic. And I think it's just so funny because so many of us invest, um, you know, a lot of money on books and seminars and workshops and conferences, looking for that next level up. To happen, whether it be in our personal, professional, romantic, or spiritual lives, and we're we're investing all of this money, and and we're seeking out these these mentors and these gurus, 
And what I realized after embarrassingly probably investing around $100,000 over the course of my 35-year lifetime in courses and self-development, that I, I was taking these copious notes and I was like, okay, this is how I human better. You know, this, this person is inspirational to me and I really want to take what they're teaching me and apply it to my daily life, whether that was, you know, emotional intelligence or, you know, physical fitness or even developing my own spirituality. And I realized that after about a week, um, all of that, you know, motivation was sort of dwindling. And it just was this pattern over the course of 10 to 20 years. And I just thought to myself, like, what am I doing wrong? Like, I know that I'm motivated at the time. What is what is happening? And I realized that it was all about my mindset and my ability to understand my, not only my motivations, what gets me going in the morning my behavior and almost my outlook on the world and the rest of humanity and and what's driving that passion every single day to to do what I do or to achieve what I want to achieve and whether that's finding the perfect you know partner in a romantic relationship and and being forever happy in love and you know finding that soulmate or whether it's advancing a business from a brand new startup to being positive in the green for the first year, and then the next couple of years, six figures, and the next 10 years, you know, a billion-dollar company. So why is it that we want the things that we want? Why do we desire the things that we desire? Is it because we've been programmed to desire those things? And, and what is the American dream or the global dream? And so I really started self-studying and geeking out on um, neurolinguistic programming, um, which a lot of my favorite coaches and gurus um, are into, and so I started reading more and more and more about how much our words that we choose every day and what we write, what we say, um, our actions, how we look at people, how we carry our shoulders and our posture, you know, and what that means. And the more that I read about that, I was like, wow, this is great. Let me study some psychology. I studied psychology. And then I started, you know, practicing um, behavioral cognitive therapy. And so being able to work with my clients that I coach for not only mindset, but for business strategy and how to scale their brands, both personally and professionally. And the more that I started geeking out, I thought people need to really know this stuff. Yes. You know, this, this is stuff that they got to know. So I started just writing one day and that was about three years ago. And, and now we have a book. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. And, and, and uh, I'm just smiling. We're, we're on the radio, so you can't see this, but I'm just smiling here because uh, the first thing you mentioned about being this self-development uh, uh, holic, <laughs> uh, uh, a very similar experience. I mean, I, I think it, the growth mindset and, and self-development, but uh, been for many years, I think right, right out of college, uh, I studied um, – philosophy and English and so there was a whole bunch of literature and as soon as I got out of school it kind of flipped to nonfiction and so I just consume nonfiction stuff so a lot of the things that you mentioned there uh, you talked about NLP I think a Richard Bandler uh, you talked about body posture shoulder posture psychology cognitive therapy these things that you've touched upon as you went down your journey um, is why why did you write this book what what really motivated you to write this book Oh, my gosh, that's a great question. Initially, it was that I was reading a lot of nonfiction, just like yourself, and I, I felt like I was a point in my life where it's like, okay, I'm, I'm past the basics of, you know, think positive and, and manifest your reality and, you know, do good in business and treat people kindly. And so a lot of the self-help books kind of that I was finding that were referred to me by a lot of friends and family members and even colleagues, I was like, okay, great. I just finished this book. I've invested 8 to 16 hours reading it or listening to it on audio. And there was always that one chapter or that one paragraph or even that one sentence that really resonated with me. And I thought to myself, I just, I, you know what, if I could just read all these books and take all of the best practices out of it and shove it into one book, that's something that I would want to read. So it's not necessarily an anthology, like a collection of work, but I, I kind of wanted to create like a cheat sheet of all of the best practices, not only for emotional intelligence, but physical fitness and biohacking and what we put into our body creates performance, um, you know, results, and also spirituality. Like what, what, does, what do we believe and how does that shape every single moment that we live our lives? 
and um, very, you know, non-biased. At no point do I even mention politics or religion. So it's kind of a cool book that can relate to anybody, despite what their background is in their faith. And um, so I, I really was just kind of, to be honest, what sparked it was like, I want to write a book that every word matters. When someone reads this book, it's not just going on and on and on about, you know, the story of how we grew up or how we, there's a little bit of that in there, but really it's something that after every chapter, it will, it will essentially create a thought process that makes the reader and anyone reading it or listening to it kind of discover themselves all over again. So I wanted to create something much more different that hasn't been done before. And I know that that's said a lot, but this truly is um, a work that will hopefully change people's lives for the better, not only in their business, but in their personal and romantic lives. I, I love it. I love it. A lot of the stuff that you touched upon there is kind of a, a broad net of things that we that people you know who are into self-development kind of focus on. But really being able to, so we call the Cliff Notes version uh, of, of getting some practical things that you can do and boil it down. I like that, that you've done that. Um, tell us about how your experience in the military played into writing this book. Oh, so it's such a wonderful question, and thank you so much for asking that. So I joined the military um, at 17. It was actually right before um, September 11th. So um, when I was in high school, I was a junior, and I was a part of what is called the delayed entry program. So you're able to sign up a year before you actually leave for boot camp. And so when I signed up, um, there was no war in Iraq. There, nothing was happening. And so the second that, you know, that that happened, a short month later after I'd signed that dotted line and my parents signed for me to depart for military boot camp in Paris Island, South Carolina with the Marines the following summer after I graduated, Everything happened, and my parents were kind of like, oh, my gosh, can we take it back? Can we take it back? We signed knowing that my, my our daughter was going to be safe and, you know, just do air traffic control for a while and then come back after four years, and we didn't really sign up for her to go and, and potentially fight this war for Lord knows how many years. And um, to be honest, it just made me want to stay more. And, and that feeling of wanting to serve the country and belonging to something and having a better purpose. When I was younger at between even 17 to 30 years old was how old I was when I served. Um, I don't think that during those ages, at least for me, it's appropriate to say that I didn't know what my purpose was. So the military and the Marine Corps gave me one. It gave me something to believe in, and it gave me something to invest every single day to work my hardest at. And something that I learned um, long, long before I got out of the Marines was that the world is our playground. Every single opportunity that we have, whether it's to serve in the military, to serve at a business or a private or a public sector company, we have the ability to explore so much within those tiny worlds that a lot of us only do what is required or that we're told to do. You know, and some people are like, well, the harder you work and the more you volunteer for, the more work you're going to get. And my mindset throughout the entire military was like, great, give me more. Give me more stories to tell. Give me more experiences. And so anytime something happened in the military where they were like, hey, who wants to volunteer for this really crappy truck driving school, you know, or who wants to go and stand watch or who wants to be flown for three days to this, you know, thing that no one else wants to do. <laughs> I was always that young Marine from 17 to even to 30, that always raised my hand. And anybody will tell you, like, why was Jess always kind of raising her hand to go to all this crazy stuff? And I said, because I'm going to have so many stories to tell by the time that I leave the Marine Corps that my grandkids and whoever is going to be like, wait, what did Grandma do? You know, so I, I wanted to collect stories along the way, and I wanted to be able to walk into a room of any sort of people, any sort of demographic, and be able to be adaptable and to turn into chameleon and be like, oh, I know how to drive a five-ton, you know, or, oh, I know how to do that, too, or, oh, wow, I visited that country. And I wanted to have stories to tell. And so I realized that the more that I started developing that mindset, I thought to myself, I'm kind of already doing what I need to be doing in order to be successful in anything. Why am I only applying this to the military? And so I, um, I'm what you call an eclectic person, a especially in my profession, because people are like, what do you do? And Christopher, I really dislike that question because they're not asking me who I am. 
what I've done or what I plan to do with the rest of my life? And those are the three questions that really are important. Because the second that we, especially as military vets, I can speak, I think, for the vast majority of us that um, I've chatted with about this, the second that they say, oh, you're a military veteran, um, the general public is like, oh, thank you for your service. That's so wonderful that you served our country. But they really don't ask what it is that we've done and where we've been and what we've seen and how that shaped us as human beings to serve, you know, in the civilian sector after we either retire or, or leave the service. So the military has taught me to be strong. It's taught me how to balance my masculine and my feminine leadership abilities. It's taught me not to emulate the leadership style or even disciplinarian style of anyone else because trying to emulate someone is essentially um, making me inauthentic to who I am. It taught me to absorb and to be a sponge and to learn and to you know, take in everything that I admire and use that to create my own person and who I am. And so um, the, the military was absolutely, it, it's sort of a sink or swim sort of thing. You, you, you do something, and it's not a matter of whether or not you want to do it. It's a matter of, you know, an order from your superior or from your organization, or essentially from the United States government and the president of the United States. And, um, you know, whether you really truly agree with what it is that you're being told, um, a good leader essentially brings up their thoughts and or opposition, and they try to be heard. And if they're heard and their viewpoints aren't really listened to, you still, as a leader, need to ensure that your troops understand, listen, this is what we're doing, this is what the boss says, and this is how we're going to do it, and we're going to do it well. And it's up to you to inspire those people. And so it really, the, the military has taught me so much, and it was 12 and a half wonderful years of my life that um, really shaped who I am, but also made me very adaptable to who I'm going to become. Absolutely. So that was quite a bit of, <laughs> of stuff there. So let me, let me uh, un, uh, or unfold some <laughs> of the stuff that we talked about there because it's very meaningful um, from that one question you talked about kind of being thrown right into the thick of it. You signed up right before 9-11. You didn't expect to, to see war, uh, and, and yet that happened, um, and, and you, you, you went into it full, full um, uh Full commitment there. You mentioned finding purpose and and, and the military helping you do that, but then also uh, you being the one who raises your hand and and kind of volunteers for stuff um, instead of just letting life happen or only doing what is required. Um, you mentioned the the things that were you were taught uh, about being strong and and balancing the masculine and the feminine leadership qualities, uh, living an authentic life, trying to get your voice out there. Lots of information there um, around the military experience. I kind of I, I smiled as well because you you were talking about having stories to tell. My my grand are your grandchildren having stories to tell? Uh, my my right. grandfather was uh, 82nd Airborne and and was in Korea and uh, so uh, we've we've got stories that we still tell about him and things that he did in the military. We're not sure how many of them were actually true <laughs> be, be, because he's, he's he's got some doozies in there, but. Uh, I guarantee you the experiences you've had will, will be talked about, especially uh, using them in the book as, as part of the, the uh, method for teaching here. Um, some of the, Let's kind of shift a little bit because we, we talked about your experience there in the military and how that plays into leadership. Uh, how, does it, how do you uh, use the book to speak to entrepreneurs as well? Oh, yes. Entrepreneurs are my absolute favorite people. And not only entrepreneurs that are doing it, but those individuals that are like, I'm going to do this one day. Those are my favorite people. And I want to sit in rooms with them and I want to chat with them and I want to hear their dreams and ideas because the reason that we become entrepreneurs or have a dream of being an entrepreneur is because we know something that someone else doesn't. Bottom line, we have an idea, we have a product, we have a service, we have something that is going to help other people or fill a void in the marketplace or we're going to take something that's already in the marketplace and we're going to make it 10 times better and we're going to put it out there. 
And the book speaks to entrepreneurs and aspiring entrepreneurs, especially because I'm the founder and CEO of now three different startup companies. And I just founded another one that actually goes along with the book to help entrepreneurs, speakers, authors, coaches, and content creators who are looking to get an inspirational and motivational message out in the world. And the book essentially talks about, in just one of the chapters only, talks about what it was like to create that business and to be reaching out and to contacting anybody I knew who was successful enough in business to say, hey, how did you do this? What did I do? And one of the best pieces of advice that I got was actually um, from a friend who'd been in business for quite a long time. And she said, listen, before you launch, what you need to do is you need to pretend that you've been launched for 10 years. And I was like, well, what do you mean by that? And she said, you need to create all of your social media You need to create all your accounts, your Twitter, your Instagram, your LinkedIn, your this, your that, and you need to start collecting reviews off of the work that you've done. Even if people have met you for five minutes and you've given them advice, or if you've done this or you've done that, start collecting those reviews and those essentially those character statements to say, listen, this is this person. I worked with her in a professional capacity. She is amazing, and this is why. This is how she's helped me. And she said, that way, when you get ready to launch, you've got your logo, you've got your reviews. You've got people that have already essentially been clients, whether it was in, you know, in-kind service or trade work or if it was paid. And um, she said, and then you need to Google as much as you can on resources on how to incorporate in your state. Because I was in Colorado at the time and she was in Florida and had no idea how to guide me through a different state process. Um, And she said, you incorporate, you choose your trade name. She said, just follow the Internet. And that was the most brilliant advice. And I was sitting there and I was just like, people pay so much money (laughs) to get this information that I just got from this brilliant woman in a matter of two minutes on a phone call. Wow. And and, um, I just was like, oh, that's how you do it? And so I've now done that with three of my companies that are doing very, very well. I'm not as active in the other two, but um, the next one is, is going to be really huge. The book's title is Potentially Human, Alchemy of Self. And the new startup company, this is actually the first time I'm sharing it publicly on live radio, is, um, is Globally Human. Um, and so that platform is specifically created for aspiring entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs that are already either looking to scale from a startup and maybe they're in the red and they're going to green or from six figures to seven figures. So it doesn't matter where they are in their journey. And as a brand strategist and content advisor, having worked in media and marketing, public relations, um, book editing, and being a public speaker for the last 10 years. So I have so much to, to bring in to say, oh, my gosh, I can help you guys. Come with me. We're going to do this. We're going to brand you. We're going to create and document your story. We're going to help you get an ebook out. We're going to match you with ghostwriters and with editors. We're going to get you a sizzle reel for speaking. We're going to get you on a podcast and show you how to create that. And we are going to market you, get you press releases, and we are going to get your inspirational message out there. And so what I've done is use the same exact platform that Airbnb or Lyft is using, where they essentially match the, the person who wants the service with the person who automatically already has the service. And so I've partnered with some of the most incredible service providers and subject matter experts in the field of everything I've just mentioned wow. that are going to serve the clients on this web and application platform that is still the, inter- the user interface is still being developed and it's not quite in beta phase yet. But um, it will be a, a membership that they will more than likely pay. We're still um, thinking about the, the fee, but it'll be nominal and um, a monthly membership to access the tools and to receive these services. And it'll be gamified as an artificial intelligence platform that literally says, hey, what is it that you're looking to do? What do you do for a living? What is your brand, product, or service? Where are you in your journey? Do you, do you want to use your book as a speaking platform? Do you want to host a podcast? Like, what is your end goal? Because entrepreneurs always have this great idea, and it's like, well, where do you want to end up in five years? Yeah, money is great. Money is great, but how do you want to impact the world? And, and how, how can I and my team of partners on this platform help you do that? And I say an affordable way, I'm talking an affordable way. It's basically going to illegitimize a lot of the other services that are out there because the partners see the value in helping inspirational thought leaders of the future. I, I, I love the fact that you've got these different startups that you've already done um, and that the entrepreneurs, one of the things that you mentioned is that, that each of these different silos – 
of either marketing or publicity that you mentioned, they, they will stumble upon them on their journey. But to have a place where they can get them all at one time, um, very, very neat idea there. The other thing you mentioned was the, the story about the woman that you had sat down with, and uh, she told you to, to pretend like you've launched for 10 years already uh, and start collecting uh, the, the, the reviews and the feedback and all of that. I, I have what I call a brag wall. Uh, because I've had a hard time, I, I have a hard time bragging. <laughs> uh, 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 and, you know, many people do. So one of the things that I learned a long time ago was uh, all of those successes and positive things where you get positive reviews, just collect them and put them in one spreadsheet. And, and um, mine is more of a source if you're having a bad day to go back and look at your, your past successes. But this can always be you know cut and paste and put on reviews for the podcast or the book or what what have you so i really can can uh, relate to that that idea i think that that was a a, a very neat um, story there let's let's switch a little bit well before we do that you mentioned two different uh, websites that i want to give out so the the one that you mentioned was potentially global human what is the website for that Okay, so Globally Human is still under construction and not quite live yet, but we'll be launching that site. Um, My co-developer and partner and I are going to be launching here in the next couple of weeks, so that will be available, um, and that website under construction is globallyhuman.org. But the book, now if somebody wanted to get the book, where would they go to find that? Yes, so the book is available for pre-order and my pre-order campaign is on a crowdfunding website specifically created for up-and-coming and and first-time authors, and it is Publishizer. It's kind of a mouthful, Publishizer.com, P-U-B-L-I-S-H-I-Z-E-R.com, and it's backslash potentially dash human. So they're going to find my book there. We are at 97 pre-orders, and Publishizer likes to have you at 500 by the end of the campaign. So I've had 30 days. We're a week into the campaign. We're at 97 pre-orders, and there's a ton of really cool bonuses and packages that I've created in there. There's even an opportunity to get me for two days anywhere in the United States, Houston. Oh, neat. <laughs> anywhere, okay. Any, yeah, anywhere in the United States, I will fly down um, to you, and I will take two nights in a hotel and come in and chat with you, help you create your vision, do a brand strategy session, or we can even do a, um, I call it soul acceleration session, where we kind of take apart everything going on in your life, and we talk about it, and we create an actual actionable strategy for you so we, in your life we've got just about three minutes left here and i've got but we just touched the tip of the tight uh, iceberg here so um <laughs> i wanted to ask you a little bit about your your nlp experience and how that relates to to the book but we've only got three minutes to do it so oh, okay uh, uh, we got it i got a timer here okay so, great great awesome question so neuro-linguistic programming um has not only helped in writing the book because i choose my words very carefully so so that they are impactful. And so that's what NLP is, neuro-linguistic program. So linguistic meaning language. So the words that we choose and the words that we hear are entirely different based on our experiences. And so for me, having that training and the way that I write this book, especially when I talk about super geeky, sciencey stuff, that I can, it's a lot of heavy words, like such as epigenetics, um, neurology, behavioral therapy. It just gets very word intensive. And so by having been trained in NLP for a couple of years now as a master practitioner, I can take all of that and I can say, how can I make this three paragraph thing that's jammed full of all of this science, how can I turn this into one to two sentences or a short paragraph that is going to be impactful and memorable by selecting my words very carefully? I love it. it's been it's been just really cool having that background knowledge because it's not just like what I take in from people when I meet them and how I kind of, you know, receive that information. Having been trained in NLP to go, oh, they said this, but this is probably what they mean. Let me clarify, you know, um, but it really has helped the language and the way that I've written the book so that it's easily understood and it's incredibly impactful with every every chapter. Thanks for listening to today's episode of Money Matters Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, visit us on the web at www.moneymatterspodcast.com. 
drop us a line on SpeakPipe on the right-hand corner. Uh, it will receive any voicemails, questions, thoughts, concerns that you have about the show. In addition to this, we recently launched a Patreon campaign. Click on the Donate Now tab to hit the tip jar and find out what Patreon's campaign is all about. <laughs> 